Oh my god, the man himself. I had two I had two actually cold openings for this. Cold opens, cold openings. Blimey. And I I can ask one of them. The Didn't other one was the Netflix series in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was if you're afraid of death, but we're going to talk about this later. So I'm going to start with an easy one. You one of the people who sort of taught me that the books the books can be abused i i saw this on the first job i think we worked on you were reading something and literally everything i'm not doing in here but like a lot of stuff was underlined or circled or there was a comment on the side can you talk me through what 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 do you underline what do you circle and how do you <laughs> use, do you use it or or is it just the way to read no it's a way to read i mean i i've always done it i mean i actually studied <laughs> not very interesting but i studied english literature and philosophy at university and i always found it as a way of helping me concentrate it's a habit more than anything else i mean i'm i'm like possibly like a lot of directors you know have a strong sense of ocd and so it's just something i keep doing and if i but i do i mean if i see something i like i underline it and sometimes i do go back and read stuff so mm. Yeah and I do take far too many I I can't do the Kindle I just can't do it mm -hmm. so so I do take a lot of as you've seen take a lot of books with me to, yeah I mean it's you know I it, weirdly when I go on the road I often have this thing about well maybe we'll be there longer than we're planned being being a doco it might take longer maybe or just you know from past experience things don't always go to plan you often end up being on the road longer than you expect and i always mm -hmm. like to have a a good book with me i mean i know there often places i go to there are shops bookstores mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. and i buy but, even more books so yeah and then someone has to ship them back but uh but listen did, did you mentioned the education so you study literature and philosophy do you feel it help you anyhow to become a better filmmaker did you have any filmmaking experience in in no, while whatsoever. studying none whatsoever i didn't originally want to be a filmmaker um uh i i wanted to write books i tried to write a book i tried to write a novel and it was fucking awful and i think at least i really <laughs> Did someone tell you that or you told no, that yourself? i just knew i knew i knew i mean that's what the english the, the english degree did help with knowing that i'd written something really really bad <laughs> <laughs> and um so but you know i mean it's a it's a massive cliche isn't it but it's you know it's all storytelling in it and um uh you know i like stories um and i thought the the medium of film particularly non-fiction film might be a good way of of trying it um mm -hmm. i mean it took me a long time to get there i mean i in some ways i kind of wish i'd gone to film school um, why but well, because I'd be interested to have, 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 have tried things out there that early on. Not, I mean, not hire any DPs. Shoot, shoot yourself. Well, the first few documentaries I made, I did actually shoot myself. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. So let's just go deep in. So the penis in the Icelandic phallic museum. So that, <laughs> that was so that, that was the, kind of a doc. Yeah, no, the, the very first, the very first, um, I was quite fortunate in the, so very quickly, I studied English literature and philosophy at university. I started a, a radio station with some other characters mm -hmm. that was, that we managed to get funding for from Stella Artois. Um, <laughs> and um, that got me a journalism course, a year's journalism course, which if I'm honest, was only useful in that it, I realized I did a work placement with, at Channel 4 News with Jon Snow and and I think I realized that just straight hard news was not for me I didn't have the temperament um, so I then flipped 360 degrees went and worked for a cable TV station uh, which back in the day was known for um, uh, for, for having a news bunny and topless darts I mean you know <laughs> Pretty the golden dreadful. the golden age of british tv yeah yeah there's some pretty dreadful low rent um television but it was a lot of fun and, and but and while doing all that you had some form of like these days you know gen y and generation z did you have sort of aspirations of winning an oscar as a documentary filmmaker no. or 
what why while doing it what was in your brain was it like sort of do a bit of this and then quit and do something else no i wanted to try i wanted to try and make documentaries i mean mm. you know i mm. i mean one early documentary filmmaker nick broomfield um one of his films uh search for maggie looking for maggie i think it was called mm -hmm. looking for yeah yeah i mean and i thought hey you know documentaries can be done in quite an interesting way mm -hmm. and so I, i wanted to make one. it's just it, it it was it was i mean you know i'm nearly 50 it was harder in those days to actually to to make you know you didn't have phones where you could shoot stuff on mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of beg borrowing and stealing and just trying to learn And then I, I, I took a job actually at Sky, and I worked for Sky. I, the, 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 it's still going actually. This channel called Sky Sports News, mm -hmm. and I, one of the reasons I explicitly took that job is they had a shift pattern, where you worked four days on and then you had four straight days off. And I had an idea for a documentary, and I wanted to just make it. And that was the very first days of the small digital cameras. I mean, I think it was the first ones. Not even the PD 150s, but the one that came out before that. Yeah. And actually, me and a friend of mine, Ashley Haynes, we we who was actually the news bunny at Live TV. Um, he had to wear the news bunny suit. He was responsible. We did a really bad thing, actually. We were responsible for the Grand National, you know, the horse race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were responsible for the office sweepstake, and we put all that money on one horse. Um, <laughs> which lost or died which won it came oh, in won. and we got oh, wow. uh, bobby joe i remember it very vividly bobby joe and it won the um i can't remember now it must have been what the 98 nine, no earlier than that 97 grand national 98 99 anyway we got early odds we got only earlier 18 to 1 i mean i'm not a betting man i've got no idea but he is <laughs> was um and uh with that money we bought one of these first digital cameras and i started making this very first documentary and then Fucking hell. so kids yeah basically take someone else's money put it on a horse you don't know anything about win yeah. <laughs> very <laughs> good advice but that's the way to do do you miss those years when an idea and a shoot were literally a days apart Do you miss that sort of ease of making stuff smaller? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I do have these romantic ideas of going back to, you know, buying a small camera again and shooting stuff myself. But, I mean, that's one of the reasons I stopped self-shooting pretty quickly because, you know, I wasn't very good. I mean, I could frame it and it looked all right, but I, I you know, I didn't understand, I didn't, I didn't understand lighting. You know, I I didn't have, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, I didn't have any training. You know, I, mm -hmm. I you know, I wanted, I, I'm like, I don't want it to look like this. I want it to look like that. You know, I want it to look like that film, The Thin Blue Line. It's like, well, <laughs> you know, you ain't going to get that on a PD-150 with the way you like shit. So, and I, 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 that's why I wanted to work with DOPs and there is you know shooting your own stuff is tough as well mm -hmm. and it, it, it distracts you from the the storytelling you know I occasionally hanker to would you say people in. romanticize it too much would you say it's, it's just a step stone but then really really you do need a bit of a team and commissioner and a distribution like what's the purpose of it all in the end to have a good film Well, I think the difficulty. Well, it's it's changed, isn't it? Because now anybody can do that. Anybody, can, you know, we've got the opposite problem where everyone can shoot something and everyone can cut something and everyone puts it out there, and you know, we're drowning in content. And it's the it's the stuff that you know the good. It's the same essentially. The good stuff will always out, won't it? Mm -hmm. But but again, going back to those early days, I mean, you know, it is again such a cliche. But I had a massive slice of luck in the. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I made this film, um, I shot this documentary myself, I cut together some material, um, I, I persuaded a friend at the time who had an edit suite to help me cut it, and I sent it everywhere, to every broadcaster. And those those days, there weren't that many. Mm -hmm. And no one got back to me. And then one guy called Darren Bender, who was working at Channel 4, and he said, I really like this, but... I can't commission this, but I want you to go away and shoot something else for me. Mm -hmm. So I made 
so my first official documentary um, was about the amateur suburban, the amateur porn scene in suburban London, uh, <laughs> which is still one of the darkest <laughs> films I've ever, <laughs> most depressing, <laughs> darkest films I've Have ever. Have you ever thought to go to a sequel of uh, <laughs> what it's like Honestly, now? Honestly, it was so, I went to a, I went to a, porn shoot in uh i think it was a living room in slough and it was uh <laughs> it was this um uh the girl was a professional porn actress and then the guys were auditioning and the guy who agreed for me to film his day was um a used car salesman in slough i mean it was so depressing but it actually made an interesting film because it was you know it was very dark and it was about do you do you feel because it's a bit of a if you look at uh your sort of list of docs and the sort of smaller docs you maybe did on a on a side while doing the bigger ones uh, do you feel there's a certain trend to unusual stories that people go for you to film kind of a, a, the the odd characters and mischievous and, and the winners and losers Maybe. Is it certain you choosing them, or do people tend to come to you with slightly odd ideas? No, I wouldn't generalize too much. I mean, the, one of the problems is I'm rubbish at coming up with my own ideas for films. I'm rubbish. <laughs> yeah, you and mentioned come, that to me. <laughs> I come up with quite a lot, and then I sort of work on them, and I'm like, actually, that's just, that's not going to sustain. And I always think in terms of feature docs now, which mm -hmm, is... Mm -hmm which is possibly not instead the... of you mean serious right like that people should think in series now in terms well, of like, I th episodes i think well there's it's a tricky one this because i'm actually doing my first ever series now i mean in 20 years of making docs i've never done one and mm -hmm. this is my first one and it it is different um they've always been around i mean they've always been on british television and some really really good ones but I think when I made my first feature doc, I loved that challenge of making a, an 80, 90 minute um, documentary film um, that can have three acts and, and can be longer than an hour. Um, and it's tricky. And I think the problem was I always used to think in terms of 90 minute films. So I'd have an idea and think, well, I'm never going to get past. Well, I'm certainly not going to get past an hour. And with some of them, I'm not sure if I'm going to get it past 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> And actually, so you I, mean on the, based on the idea, right? You mean? Yeah, and I wish I'd made. I wish I'd turned a few more of those ideas into short films. I did it. Well, that's once. what I was, well, that's what I was going to ask. Sorry to, to interrupt, but that's what yeah. I was going to ask. In terms of coming up with idea, you know, for say maybe younger guys and girls looking at this and, and kind of learning from your experience as well. Do you feel just go for it or because with yes. your experience, you sort of know, okay, there's access, there's this, there's this, there's this, that it sort of stops you from doing it. No, I because think you've been you, in the game for some time. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm fortunate. And you know, going back to my early days, I picked up a camera and just started making something. No, I mean it's even harder now. I, you know, I've I've spoken to, you know, a few young directors recently. One of whom I may actually end up being her exec producer. And it's like you just need to go and film some of the story now. I mean, it's even more. I mean. It, a few years ago, it was enough to have a treatment and a pitch. and But now no one will take you seriously unless they can look at some tangible footage and, and, and see, you know, is there a story here? Um, are there good characters? Um, so you, you have to go and... You have to go and do it. Something. Just start. Yeah. Can you talk me through? Because I think for for myself, including like, because Docker was sort of a wave that just sort of took me over a few years ago. That's when we met, I think, on that... Amazon quote unquote commercial, which was kind of doco and so on. And then I did another job with you, but that was kind of new to me, you know, that before I always assumed from sidelines that you sort of find a character, you make a doc around them. It's successful. Great. Everyone loves it. In reality, it's sort of similar to fiction to an extent where yes, there is some form of story potentially, but then you cast characters, you even film them sometimes, like you were saying, can you talk, about the process of making, say, an average feature dog these days, just so people sort of understand the process. So what's a taster date, for example? Like maybe talk in, 
yeah, as an example, I don't know if you can talk about the DB Cooper. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's a good making. example because that's actually, for example, yeah, that's actually again. I think I've been a stroke of kind of lucky, and you know, just just a little breakdown for you who know who don't know. It's a feature doc uh, about uh, airplane hijacking for HBO slash BBC. So that's where it ends as a product. Can you talk yeah. a little bit how it became that product? Well, again, so that is actually the first time I've ever shot a taster. And again, I've been fortunate and then I've managed to get films off the back of treatment and or a book option or something like that. But this was so a company I know approached me with this idea. And I initially was a little skeptical because I thought that's not going to sustain 90 minutes. And I thought they're just a bunch of wackos there's not enough so depth. they they came with idea to you as a yeah. director to execute it basically to to actually yeah. make it. well mm -hmm. to shoot a taster i mean you know cards mm -hmm. on the table they had forty thousand pounds from sky atlantic to shoot the, i don't know if i should have even said that amount but anyway i have <laughs> but they had a lot of money to make a taster which is very rare and mm -hmm. even part of me was thinking well this is a good opportunity to you know to try something out you know and mm -hmm. to um uh, I mean, I kind of liked the story, but I wasn't totally convinced that it could sustain 90 minutes. I mean, I have to say, you know, two thirds of the way through the project, I still wasn't quite sure at times if it was going to sustain 90 minutes. Or the but, edit. <laughs> yeah, we got there where well, we got to 84 and 16 seconds. But <laughs> so um, you know, very quickly, the story is the, the very short story is Thanksgiving Eve 1971 a guy in a black suit, wearing a black tie, black sunglasses, gets on a flight going from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, carrying a black attache case. The plane takes off. As it takes off, he hands the stewardess a note and says, I have a bomb in my briefcase. Um, she then, they circle above Seattle. He gives another note with their demands. He wants four parachutes and, and $200,000. And so... <laughs> The airline and the FBI agree to this. They land in Seattle. He lets all the passengers off. They bring on the money. They bring on the parachutes. He keeps the air crew on. He says, take me to Mexico. Ten minutes into the flight, it's an old 727 where stairs go down at the back. You, if you Google 727, you see you get on them. Anyway, they get, they're at 10,000 feet. He straps on the parachute, straps on the money, opens the door, jumps, never seen again, biggest FBI hunt in, in, in history. So anyway, it's a great story, but I'm like, well, what are the other elements of this story? You can't just tell the story of that flight. You know, it's, it's you know, it, well, first of all, much of the cabin crew had never spoken about it. But what was interesting is- So that access there is, goes through your brain straight away as a documentarian. Immediately, immediately. What's, what's the access? Who can you your talk first to? Thought, your first thought in a documentary should be, who is telling this story? Who, is, who are the storytellers? Who are going to carry it? Because if you have no one to tell the story, you end up with, and I've done it myself on a, on a, on a, on a, on a couple of docs back in the day, you know, you end up with swathes of horrible, boring voiceover. And, you know, you want, who is going to tell this story in the best possible way? And the interesting thing about the Cooper film was that, so they never find this guy, D.B. Cooper. And so there are theories as to it could be this person, it's my brother's husband, you know, it's... So there are people out there who claim to know him. So you've got, you've got a pool of storytellers there. And so the taster was, okay, we go out there and do these people sustain a film? And I went out there and sort of fell in love with the story and became convinced they do, they do. And that was story. about four years ago, if I'm correct, because you showed oh. me that taster so when you were shooting that ago. commercial so long ago and the film uh, is only was... now ready to be released yeah yeah april two. why does it take so long what what's the well, situation it, it doesn't always doesn't always take so long this one was different in the we shot the taster sky atlantic loved it loved the taster we then spent they said we want to go big on this they gave us a very good budget for a feature doc um, we started doing, you know, the budget and all that takes time. And then Sky suddenly announced that they weren't going to do feature docs anymore. So <laughs> I think my, that was my wife said that was the moment you should have walked away. But I didn't. And um, I couldn't really. But you use Sky's money to shoot the taster, though. <laughs> 
right? They're, yeah, they no, we had to give them, we, But the deal was that if you get it commissioned, we had to give them the money back. Ah, and okay. Know, so you can't use the it. Money back. <laughs> yes, I hope nobody from Sky's on here because maybe we didn't give the money back. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so just to explain Sky and HBO is two different things just for those who kind of might not very different Shit, so I Sky stops doing it. features HBO still is doing features and so they pick up the kind of the, no the it was story. even more complicated than that I mean I mean the, the irony is is that Sky Atlantic have now announced they're going back into features and it's like oh you know did you do it too late fuck me off <laughs> um, obviously being a director I have a massive ego thinking it's all about me <laughs> But um, so then uh, we pitched this film around, around, and around for for months, and you know there was some. Interest. Can you explain to people because I think details are interesting here for the kids who are watching and, and might go into it and, and do the same as you. Pitching, I seen you pitch at that Sheffield kind of film market pitching sessions. It's a, a, you walk in, it's basically like a market. sports hall, meat market. In fact, so weirdly, it, I found the, found the, um, I found the cat. I've just been tidying out my office because, you know, what else are you supposed to do at the moment? And, um, <laughs> and I found, I actually ripped out of, I found the catalog from that year. And it's interesting finding it and going back through all these projects. It's quite depressing and thinking, so many of these projects, I don't want to name them because that feels unfair, but so many of these projects probably didn't get made and some of them mm. look great or maybe they're mm. still being made. But there's, so there's just to entry. clarify, there's our entry yeah, in the it. meat market. So that was our brochure. So what, yeah, a... that's, that's one of the places, you know, unless, you know. Some so basically just to very... explain, imagine, John, John, you, you aim this for like, a oh, couple decades at least, right? Longer. Let's just clarify. So meat market is you walk in, it's like a sports hall full of tables. On each table, there's basically a project. And then yeah. people from different channels from all over the world, they come in and they're like, okay, this sounds interesting. I'm going to give you so much money for it, for basically yeah. the rights to distribute in different territories. So yeah. you sold it to like Norway or you sell it to Russia or someone in Britain might pick it up. But it's basically projects to be made. Right. That's yes. the, the, it's, it's basically like speed dating for documentaries. So you yeah. get, I mean, it literally and it's tens and really tens get. a day, right? Because when I walked yeah. in, it was like just yeah. noise of people pitching to each other. Yeah. And you're pitching, um, yeah, you're pitching to broadcasters around the world. And, you know, the reality is everyone wants an American broadcaster on board because they've got the most money. Um, mm. And, you know, uh, you know, it's great it was invaluable having the likes of Norway um, and, and the rest of Scandinavia on board because that brings you a, a you know, a, a very tangible chunk. But you need one sizable broadcaster. And um, mm -hmm. ultimately, we were fortunate enough to get... Um, well, we already had the BBC Storyville on board, but they, they, they don't fully finance docs. Mm -hmm. So... So they need like a second, at least another yeah. one to it. But I think having them on board brings a lot of credibility and a lot of kudos. And I think it encourages other broadcasters who might be more nervous in having to put in all the funding themselves to come on board. So, I mean, not all docs are made in this way. You know, Netflix docs, majority of aren't. They're just fully financed. Uh, which is why everyone wants to make Netflix docs. And that um, goes through the similar process. It's basically a pitch meeting, or they go to some of these markets as well. How would that work uh, if someone or, wants to make a Netflix? It just, it, there's, no, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, I'm the, 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 the current, I mean, just to finish off on Cooper, you know, it, you know, like anything, it, it does come down to previous connections. And, you know, I, I, was able to help bring on HBO on board because I'd made a film for them, you know, now 10 years ago. And so there, there's a trust there. They're, they're like, well, we liked your last one. Um, so hopefully you won't fuck this one up. But um, so they came on board. But it, it, it varies. I mean, sometimes you don't have to pitch. Sometimes you just get a straight commission. They like the story. They're willing to take a pitch on it. Um, yeah, Happens. but this one, this this one was one of the ones that had to be pieced together, and they're the hardest because it often takes you. I mean, it took us longer to raise the money than it did to take to shoot the film. 
It's true. Yeah, actually, it's true. I just realized because it was shot relatively quickly. It was a few trips to US. Yeah, uh, yeah. studio setup you did in London, and then quite long edit yeah. process. Man, yeah. thanks yeah. for breaking that one down. Um, I'm gonna quickly scroll because there's a couple questions I saw. Please, please, please use. There's this kind of question mark thingy below me to ask them. Uh, but I can read one out because it's kind of in the topic we discussed quickly about like who is going to tell the story. So Andre Luca is asking, any tips about approaching a person that should carry the story but is a boring storyteller? <laughs> Ugh, that's a hard one. Um, is it down to the edit or are there other ways to do it? Um. I mean, I think uh, they, it depends why they're boring. If they're just not very good at telling a story, then you're in trouble. Um, if they're carrying the film, you're in trouble because you, there's no getting around it. That It goes back to what I said originally. It's who is telling the story. I mean, I genuinely do like... My, if I had any stylistic consistency in my films i like my films to be told by an ensemble by a collection of people even if there's a central character i like other spin-off characters to provide light and shade so i think that's one way if the main person is boring um then you need other characters to cast light on them i mean the problem is if someone's not a good storyteller there's just there's not a lot of ways around it. But you'll be surprised at, you know, how much you can get out of someone um, um, in an edit, particularly if you're editing them with other material, other characters. But, I mean, I wouldn't like to hang a film on just one person anyway. I think it's... I think it becomes, you know, as this... Insta Live may well be become quite soon very sort of <laughs> mono, monochrome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But for a story, yeah, unless because obviously it's not any story has sidelines and it has antagonists to fight your protagonist and so on. So surely, yeah, there's more story. So good point. Yeah, just add if someone is boring, add more people to make it less yeah. boring. Basically, disguise their um, I need to ask. You mentioned the ego. And you told me I can ask, tell me my Scientology movie. So you yes. directing a film for Louis Theroux, who is obviously yes. a household sort of a name and, and the love of many people in documentary, especially in UK. It's called my Scientology movie, I guess, meaning Louis, or maybe me, meaning Marty, who is the main character then, who is sort of creating his own story. What's the relationship there? So a presenter-led doc, quite established presenter, then a director known for his kind of bold choices and known for his, you know, ways to shoot stuff. How do you come, how did it work together? What was that experience like? Well, first off, it was a great experience. I mean, I think it's probably the most fun I've ever had making a film. I mean, it was very tricky at times, but in terms of our relationship, I mean, when it says my Scientology movie, it's Louis's Scientology movie. I mean, I have a massive input into how that's being made, but I'm under no illusions, and I was never under any illusions before I started making it, that he is upfront and central. People are not going to come to a cinema to watch my Scientology movie. Maybe two or three might. Might come to the Brixton Ritzy on of an afternoon when they've got the cheap tickets. But if it's Louis Theroux's My Scientology movie, there's a good chance that people are going to go, lots of people are going to go to several cinemas, which was obviously an attraction in the very first place. And that was a funny one because that I was approached, again, not my idea, never have any fucking ideas, and I was approached by um, um, the producer of um, Man on Wire and Searching for Sugar Man. Simon, Simon Chin, Chin, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And listen, I was definitely not the first director he approached. There was a list, and I think they'd got quite far down that list. I mean, they'd even, you know, they tried to shoot some stuff with a couple of quite significant Hollywood directors, um, which I'm still not allowed to name. Um, I can't even remember. I don't think ne Louis even names them in his book. But, um, mm -hmm. and I was initially a bit like, I'm not sure about this, because I've never worked with someone in front of the camera in that way, a presenter. And, um, and I remember, you know, a, a cameraman I've worked with quite a lot had done it himself, and he's like, oh, it's quite hard work, because you end up doing twice the work. 
and you get mm -hmm. and it's quite it's quite thankless mm -hmm. and so i was humming and hawing and it was my wife who was uh, again she said you know get over yourself it's not first of all you know louis not really a presenter in the traditional sense you know he doesn't present to camera he's very much a character in his own films and you know he's louis through and you know i i grew up watching his stuff i mean i loved weird weekends so it felt like an opportunity and again the brief from simon and the bbc was do something different with louis we don't want mm -hmm. another louis tv program it's got to be different so it's got to be it's got to be made with the view that we want to try and play it in cinemas so you can't you can't have you know another sort of just a longer louis version it's got to have something else something a bit different to it and all the problems with that film were at the beginning where i'd sort of join the film and then i'd leave the film again so initially i'm like yeah i'm interested and i'm like no i don't want to make a film present and they're like no 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 this is crazy it's louis and then we worked on this idea of doing something really different and i came up with this idea that was way too radical i mean it was just nuts and then louis like no i can't do that and i'm like okay well that's all i've got and then i left is it because there's a certain brand there's some expectations of what louis through doc is no, I don't think so. Well, I think, you know, there's always an expectation is that Louis is going to be in it and he's going to be doing his stuff with, with characters and exploring, you know, interesting characters. Can you tell the what the idea was? Yeah, I mean, there's not... I mean, again, he, he writes about it. I'm not trying to flog his book here. I'm getting no money off the back of it. But he it was quite interesting. <coughs> Suddenly he's reading his book and thinking, oh, God, and he's actually written it pretty much exactly as it happened. Um, so the man don't lie. Um, but, um, yeah, no, the idea was we want to, so Louis had seen Act of Killing and he liked that idea of, 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 um, reenactment, mm -hmm. reenactments, but in a, you know, in, in a, in a more live, you know, visceral workshop kind of way, rather than sort of drama stage. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of this Iranian film called Close Up, which I think is a work of genius, which is, which really flirts between, you know, fiction and, and non-fiction. And, and so there was, from both of us, an ambition to just have more than Louis, just his usual thing of, which works, but have more of his usual thing of interrogating people in their kitchens or, you know, in their habitat. Um, so we came up with this idea for reenactment, but I took it really too far. I mean, the, the, my first treatment, it was all about the making of a movie i'm making a movie about louis trying to make a movie I mean, it had so many layers of <laughs> and i think louis was like there's actually it's a like really, synagogue at new york a bit there's a really good quote in his book actually on that i can see his book on that top shelf but i'm worried if i try and get it down it's it could end in disaster but um <laughs> in fact, no, i think i exactly. wrote it i wrote it i wrote it, it, it I, i've got it somewhere i'll read it out because it's it's a good yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway yeah. listen Louis's like, well, I'm not doing that. I mean, there was another stalemate, but there was still something in it. So essentially, that first scene that's in the film, where we we try and cast an actor to play the head of of of, of the church of Scientology, David Miscavige, that was that was kind of let's see what happens. In in some respects, that was our taster. You know, mm -hmm. if if this doesn't work, then maybe we just we leave it and we all walk away, and. Mm -hmm. You know, because they'd originally shot some material before I came on board, which was just, which was Louis with Marty at his house in Texas. And, you know, it was interesting, but it still felt like that traditional Louis TV show, which, believe me, works. But again, we kept saying, you know, you know, people will have a higher expectation if they come to see it at the cinema. They don't just want to see a longer Louis TV program. So... Mm -hmm. So it was, let's use Marty and do something different with him. And that first, that first shoot, it, it worked. And we felt something's happening here. So we just, we kept going with that. But we were, we were slightly spoiled on that film because, you know, we didn't really have much of a story. It was just like, let's try these reenactments. Let's explore the church through this and other whistleblowers and see what happens. But there was always the safety net of Louis, you know, because... You know, he's very, very good. I mean, he's, you know, he's really good. In in front of camera, he's, um, you know, there were a couple of moments where, 
you know in fact i did a thing he he just did this tour in australia and i was asked to record a video and they picked that moment if you've seen the film there's this great moment it is a great moment even though we made it. it is a great moment where we're outside the base at night and they come out and we're filming them and they're filming us and then louis just pulls out this little flip camera from his pocket and then starts filming the guy filming him and there's this weird and i do remember thinking at the like time stand off yeah shit man you're good you know that's that and i remember that they were saying so how did you direct that scene i'm like well i just stood back and you know, watched it happen <laughs> you <laughs> mentioned you mentioned egos you know like and you both i guess have pretty large egos and pretty large and, and strong opinions how yeah. what's your advice in, in navigating maybe using his him an exam, as an example but even going into meetings with someone who commissions be it hbo or bbc how, what's that minefield how do you walk it because you have quite a character and i don't think you're hiding it usually do you then have to play it down in the meetings or are you just you like that's what yeah, they're gonna no, get unfortunately i am me um which doesn't always work but but i think you have to you know again it's a cliche but if you if you've had any success in film and i'd like to think i have had some success you know that it is a genuinely collaborative medium you own it only works if you collaborate and you know when someone brings something that's great to the table or you think something you 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 stand by something and you, you, you and it doesn't work in an edit you can see that there's no point in and it was a you know it was a a very a really collaborative process with louis i was surprised at how collaborative it was actually i expected to um I mean, we did lock him out of the edit suite for the first few weeks, deliberately. Um, but, was um, he, like, okay with it? Or was it, he, like, a news thing? He was a bit, him? like, again, he, 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 he's very fun. I, I never really got his... Louis's very good at hiding away what he... You know, which is why he's so successful on screen in some of those moments. He's very good at hiding what he's actually thinking. So we mm. never quite shared it until I read the sections in the book where it's actually quite funny and quite revealing but we did it deliberately because it was like give us a go with the material first um and then when he came in he was you know he's good he's really good in the cutting room and louis by his own admission is you know he's not a director he doesn't want to direct things he wants to be directed and you know he takes re direction really well i mean it was bumpy at the beginning but it was bumpy at the beginning because we were approaching it both very deliberately differently and, it was and as a and as a director in something like a uh, presenter-led piece like my scientology movie what's your role in terms of in in well you're coming up with project you're coming up with scenes you're coming up with certain overall arch of it say yeah no like, so here's brainstorming example. so there's and, so and how is example. it different today today like as in day to day directing of that film when you were in LA filming oh it's 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 very different and I had to learn because I I'm used to asking the questions in my films and I'm used to of interrogating course, yeah. the subjects so the very first day we're filming before we even do the casting we're shooting a scene in Marty's hotel room before we go and do the casting and there's this bonkers moment which some people still think stays and is not stays at all and one of the things as a documentary filmmaker you dream of is we're filming in this hotel room and um, <laughs> yeah it's the opening right yeah this 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 woman in a bikini knocks and this very attractive woman in a bikini knocks on the glass window and uh so i beckon her in and then i start talking to her and it's like which is what I do in one of my own films. And then Louis like, okay, hang on a minute, John, I'll take it from here, you know? And I had to learn to shut up, which, I, mm -hmm. you know, I find quite difficult if anyone knows mm -hmm. me. And so particularly <laughs> in those first few scenes, I'd be jumping in mm -hmm. and it was like, in fact, he, he, I think it was, he, 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 did a, he did a podcast about his book and he was quite funny in that way. He said, you know, there's, you know, you know, there'd be all these moments where John would be sort of jumping in at the beginning and, 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 and Lou is like, look, 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 that's the only reason I'm here, John. I've got to do that bit. Otherwise, I'm doing nothing. You know? <laughs> so. 
So that was what we had to get used to at the beginning. So that was quite that was quite unusual for me to stand back and while Louis doing his thing mm -hmm. with characters. I do think I interrupted more um, because I think he's more used to it just filming and filming and filming. And I hate just filming and filming and filming because for me, that's not directing. That's just like CCTV. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, there was a, getting that rhythm right. But then it was coming up with the reconstruction moments or just, you know, free, here's another example. Louis wanted to do, he wanted to go through the actual drills. When you're in the Church of Scientology, you go through these layers of extraordinary drills. They're bonkers, you know. And Louis just said, okay, we just get a couple of our actors together. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start doing these drills. And um, you and Will can, Will, who was my cameraman for Indeed, that film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Will Pugh. You can, you can just, you can film a little bit of it and then you and Will can go off and have like a three martini lunch, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> that was the one occasion I'm like, well, if we are going to do this, Louis, we need to do it properly and we need to stylize it and we should do it. And we had, me and Will had the the old George Lucas film. You know, that I can't remember its name. T yeah, 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 the, the numbers, yeah. TH, the, the white fiction. infinity room. Yeah, yeah. The, so we, what we set debut. up this white infinity room with all these fixed cameras and the access and we filmed these fixed cameras all day, all day. And so that was, you know, that was my... You know, that's where I earned my directing chops and cash on that, was to, to realise these ideas of Louis into a more filmic um, conception. Right, I think, yeah. you know, it, it, it kind of worked well. How does Q&A session work for something <laughs> like that sort of film? I watched three Q&As yesterday just to see what's the dynamic like. Is this where the ego takes a bit of a hit for a director? Again, like I said before, people are coming to a cinema and they're coming to a Q&A. They want to mainly ask questions to Louis. I have no issue with that. It's the reason I'm in a big, you know, our premiere was at the Queen Elizabeth Hall on the South Bank. There were, you know, you know, hundreds and thousands of people in there. It was, it was amazing. So, and, you know, the majority of the questions are to him and some of the questions are to me. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's I think I've told you more. this, this interesting situation. I was, I think there, I was, uh, oh, yeah, 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 you said, yeah. it was like ages ago. Yeah. It was you and Louis on stage. I was just, yeah, I went to, to see it with Q and A from, from him and director, which, and then yeah, randomly we, for like a year less, um, we worked together. Um, I wanted to come back to something you mentioned, the OCD that directors have. Can you talk me through how does one deal? Because there are a couple of questions people asked me before this, so not just live in a session, but the, for you, the kind of the sense of, you know, constant, constantly being on a pencil, you know, constantly kind of being in a project, but they're still in consideration, or, or you don't know if you got it, you haven't rejection as well to some extent how does one sort of navigate that field and i think you've just got to deal with it i mean my uh, my, my deal is i get really angry for about a day and then i tend to just <laughs> let it go um i mean it's 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 uh i mean i i got more used to it doing commercials which i started doing probably only about halfway through my documentary career um mm -hmm. uh there's a lot of rejection in commercials because you are mainly pitching head to head with two other directors but in doc projects quite often you i mean you do pitch against other directors um it's only annoying when if you think you've you've you actually think you've got a better idea but again the ego thing is i mean i think most directors probably think that anyway so <laughs> i mean there was one case recently which again i think I, i'm free to talk about but i pitched i mean i've got quite a tradition of sports documentaries in my locker um to extend a cliched metaphor and i was asked to pitch on um a documentary which i think will be coming out soon about uh, the former Manchester United manager, Sir Alex Ferguson, um, who's a great character, and um, went to an interview with 
um, the producer, the exec producer, and the kind of gatekeeper to the project, I guess, who was um, Sir Alex Ferguson's son. And uh, I wrote a treatment, which I obviously thought was fucking great. Uh, actually, genuinely, there are moments when you know a treat when you write a treat and you're like, oh, "That's all right, it's okay." But this one, sometimes they just happen, and the magic happens, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like I'm channeling this story through me. It works. I get it. It feels right. You know, I've pitched on other docs, especially in many other commercials where you're writing and thinking, "This doesn't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't I'm not sure how to make this." Um, and um, and then the film ended up being directed by Alex Ferguson's son, <laughs> who's, who's never made a film in his life. But then mm. um, that was possibly the only way of getting it made. So they're quite hard to take. And then, but there are some, you know, I mean, actually, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. The, I was a pro- so you mean the sort of fairly, fairly losing is not an issue. It's when it's a bit. Yeah, although although another example is there's just sometimes you realise you're not the right person for a certain mm -hmm. film. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not. I don't think I'd be very good at very very serious. Um, maybe that's not the best example. But another example, a film I'm looking forward to seeing, a documentary I'm really looking forward to seeing is the um, there's a documentary that's been made on Charlie Chaplin by. Um, oh wow the two directors who did Notes on Blindness, if you've seen that film. Mm -hmm, which mm -hmm, is a mm -hmm. great, great mm -hmm, documentary. It's very good, yeah, very good. And I was approached to make that film before them, and I was just like, I'm not sure what I'd bring to a documentary on Charlie Chaplin. I think he's amazing, I think he's great, but I'm not... But sure why? You don't, you don't believe in your own sort of strength as a documentarian? Well, guess, or is it well, the angle? No, I think I just go on my immediate gut instinct is, do I have an interesting idea for that film? And I didn't really come up with one. I thought it's, it's often not a good sign. How, um, how long do you give yourself to come up with an idea? Oh, a few days. Say? A few days. I do some reading. I think, you know, going back to what we originally talked about, I mean, you know, I have a lot of books, but I, you know, I'm old school. I'm a great believer in documentaries come out of proper old-fashioned research reading around the subject finding something that might you know when i did the scientology film i pretty much read all the you know the decent books on 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 the church and because i think you know it's not documentaries isn't just about the fucking lenses that you choose and the way you light it it is you know there's got to be a sort of you know bedrock of good research and storytelling to i don't think it's at all to an extent about lenses and, and lighting i genuinely it sounds strange i guess coming from dp but i genuinely believe it's the it's the last polish really like not even grade or so on or mix it's cinematography to an extent is the last polish because if if the idea holds it holds itself much better than i think fiction film does fiction you expect to have it and i think it can sustain less of a shitty look um if i may but i think in docs it is that soul and i think what do you generally think in terms of the that sort of look almost overtaking documentary these days say you look at some of the netflix pieces and there's almost no soul left but it's lit to to it's lit to perfection kind of commercially almost yeah i mean i think these things go in and out of fashion as well in terms of doc you know when the 5d first came out there was all that fashion for all the docs to have this sort of shallow depth of field and it felt quite interesting at the beginning but then they all looked like that and then you know it, then it was down the lens and then everyone's shooting down the lens you know you know there are you know god it's everywhere you know docs on you know i'm not being snobby but docs on icv2 are shot down the lens and it's like well hang on this just doesn't feel interesting anymore it just it feels like wallpaper and then the two camera thing came along and everyone used the two camera and interesting i'm doing my first netflix series at the moment and it was like we're going to be shooting on two cameras now there's a very particular reason because of access that we can't shoot on two cameras on this i can't go into detail on that at the moment it sounds very mysterious and foreboding it isn't it's just an access thing that i can't discuss at the moment and we're back to shooting on one camera 
and it it feels it feels it feels quite revolutionary just because we're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's I do yeah I think you're right. The cinematography in docs does get overblown. Although if you, if you have ambition of putting your doc into a cinema, I, I think it helps if it looks good. I do think it. Um, but not just looks good, but has a great sound mix and a great score and 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 all those things that people call cinematic. Yeah, they're, they're kind of the, the, the fun. Yeah, the, the fun. Yeah, the fundament of it. No, I know what you mean, but it's generally. But like... it's interesting. I, I'm, you know, I pitch on docs, and and I'm genuinely keen to see if I don't get because there are so many different ways of. I mean, you know, a really good example at the moment is Tiger King, which is, you know, everyone is like, this is the most amazing. I mean, and it's, listen, I'm not dissing it. I can sit here and be snotty about it. I fucking watched all seven episodes, although you could have done it in four or five. But, but it, it, it disappoints me and it feels at times like it's a, just a parade of freaks. Can you... Depth. I just got one final point on this while I'm on my Tiger King soapbox because we were talking about Louis Theroux, and it's yeah. interesting because Louis made a film with the central character of, of Tiger course. King, of Joe course, exotic. And I went back and watched that last week, and it is so different. And in fact, Joe Exotic, it's almost like he's a completely different person. First of all, he's incredibly likable. Um, you know, he's not a total Egypt, but. Um, you know, again, it's a cliche, but there are there are so many different ways you can tell the same story, and I think that's. But there's also so many ways. Let's maybe go into that a little bit of manipulation in Doc. How much of a Doc sometimes manipulates the characters or the story or the setting to make it more interesting? So where where yeah, is the kind well, of balance I, yeah, I, of I, truth I, there? Well, I think there's all. Well, first of all. All documentaries manipulate their characters. You have to. No, John. Oh, John left. <laughs> I think Netflix Netflix joined us and disconnected. Let me see if I can um, add John. You're back. I think that was ne Netflix cutting the feed. <laughs> it's an exactly the same joke. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. They're like, oh, no. Uh, hi, uh, hi no, 32. I mean, it, it, what, what, what was that? You have to manipulate all characters most people when they see one of your films don't like it it's their first reaction they don't like it i mean i you know i filmed with the, the cyclist bradley wiggins and what i thought was a you know a really quite sort of you know honest but quite an affectionate portrait the first time he watched it he turned around he said i don't think i like any of it i fucking hate it and i think mm -hmm. that's quite a common reaction for any anybody that's been in a film but you know, again, these are real cliches, but I really think they stand true, is that you have to be really honest with your characters before you do it. And you have mm -hmm. to say, you know, I said to Bradley, we did the first bit of filming with Bradley, and he, he wasn't enjoying it. And he's like, oh, you know, I don't want to answer those questions. And I'm like, well, let's not make the film. Let's not bother then. You know, you have to trust me that I'm not going to stitch you up and I'm going to present your story That's accurately. That's something like you mentioned to me when we discuss stuff you've been approached by or you're turned down by those like, I don't know, I don't want to name because I don't know what's in the book, so it's not. Um, but I'm always fascinated. Does it come with your experience and you've, you know, you've done quite well as a documentarian that you kind of easily turn down projects as well? Like something like that to say to Bradley Wiggins, who the doc, which probably will be watched a lot, just on a pure character. To be like, let's just not make a film. Does it come from the fact you have another six projects lined up? Or does it come no, from the gut feeling there's not. no point in that? Absolutely mm. not. No, it's Jesus. If only I did have six projects lined up. No. Um, but it's, you know, there's long periods where I'm doing nothing. Um, so, well, it's partly a game of chicken. It's like, you know, do you want to do this properly or should we not bother doing it at all? But also it's like, if from the get-go he's going to be like that, then the film is already compromised. Mm -hmm. But I think as long as you're straight with someone and telling them, I told him, look, I want to ask you at some point in this film about your relationship with your father, which is a really difficult one. And we're going to mm -hmm. come to that at some point. I'm not going to do it on day one, but it's going to be out there. And I think one of the problems going back to, again, Tiger King, I mean, you know, I'm, it feels like I'm being a real snob 
you know, dissing it. Um, it's wildly successful. I can't argue against it. But, you know, I read in the New York Times that, you know, some of those characters have been told by the filmmakers that they're making a film about the conservation of tigers. You know, it's like, come on, guys. That's, you know, that's poor. That's what gives documentary filmmakers... That makes it harder for us the next time we approach someone. And I, I but think... Have, have, if you zoom in on your work as well, have you ever had to lie to, to get certain shot or reaction or or permission maybe what with a with an actual character i'm filming with yeah no no lying never works you always get caught out and then someone can come back <laughs> and say true. someone can come back and say well i, I i'm I, i withdraw my consent for the film it's self-defeating mm -hmm. you know we one of the first feature doc i made live forever which was about musicians in the 90s it's and great yeah i watched it yesterday because that's why i wanted to watch it and yeah i found it on on youtube somewhere yeah it's great and so we approached you know one of the first people we approached was damon alban from blur and he said that he'd love to do the film he felt, it felt like the right moment it was just as Britpop was finishing and we shot with him first and on the day he was an absolute fucking nightmare to film with he was grumpy he was difficult he was awkward uh it was my first feature doc i was terrified i was shooting on super 16 which was terrifying and um he was really really difficult uh but it was still quite a good interview i thought and at the end he refused to sign a release form and you know we said well that gives us a real problem with our financiers we can't just keep cutting this film if if there's a chance you won't be in it and you want some sort of editorial approval and he said i don't want editorial approval i just don't want to be stitched up i've been stitched up and i said to him i looked him in the eye and said mm -hmm. i am not going to stitch you up in this film so you can come and watch the film when we're finished it and see that and so it came to the end <laughs> we'd forgotten about this and then it's like oh shit we still got to show it to damon and then about three <laughs> or four months in we've been cutting for three or four months which is quite short for a feature doc and damon's management ring up and say well damon wants to come in and and have editorial approval I'm like well, he hasn't got editorial approval he can come in and watch it so we haven't stitched him up but he hasn't got editorial approval anyway he came in it was pretty excruciating And then he said, well, I've decided I didn't like the interview at all, so I, I, uh, I want to do the interview again, which was, that was, that was, that was, a, that was a, an unexpected one. And I said, okay, fine, you can do the interview again, but you can't watch the film. You know, mm -hmm. we've not shown the film to Noel Gallagher, we've not shown it to Jarvis Cocker, we've not shown it to Liam, Liam Gallagher, so you can't watch it. So there was this weird standoff with his manager and Dane and us. And they said, all right, I'll watch the film. I said, okay, if you watch the film, you can't do your interview again. And so he watched it, and you suddenly remember there's some really quite excruciating bits in it with regards to him. But there, you know, he watched it and he said, you know what, that was quite painful at times, but you didn't stitch me up. You know, you, you, you honoured my story honestly. And, it, you know, it's... So And he signed the release form and, 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 and the happy day. So I do think you just have to be honest. And, it, you, know, you know, when I read that Tiger King story in the New York Times about them saying, oh, we're making a film about, you know, concert, you can just tell, they keep a moment in the film with Carol Baskin. Is it Carol Baskin? Yeah. And you hear the director from behind the camera when he sees what she's originally wearing, you know, that tight, and you go, oh, great that she's wearing that. It's like... We're going to portray these guys in a certain way. And it, it and it's revealing if you go and watch Louis Theroux's version of that, th that character and that story. And there is just more depth to it. But people want freak shows, man. That's what they want. They want, they want programs that can be turned into it gifts. Sells. Yeah, mm. and memes. <laughs> yeah. Listen, talking about the Damien's interview, I watched it yesterday. Off the record, so to speak. Yeah. I thought if you're saying it's he's portrayed honest, do you yeah. feel he had basically admits that this whole blur of a, the oasis is kind of his idea or marketing idea to an extent as well, which just propelled out of control. That's yeah, I what think actually that's happened. Much, I think that's pretty much the story now. Yeah. Accepted story. Yeah. In the great yeah, moments was... of British history that we'll always talk over in, 
years to come forget the war of the roses and you know the uh, <laughs> the magna carta it's blur vases oasis <laughs> it's interesting yeah and it's interesting that you worked with a uh, noel gallagher a few times afterwards if i'm correct it was an no, apple commercial as well no, and no just yeah no an apple music thing that was the only that was the only other thing yeah no he's great he's great to film with great to film do you do you keep friends or at least acquaintances with some of the characters you filmed you sort of no. cut it off no i don't think so you're not there to make friends with them you're not and but just I accidentally think... you sort of never made friends by accident with like some not conspiracy really, guys no. in a trailer somewhere in the u.s talking about db cooper <laughs> no i don't think so because i think there are people that sometimes make that mistake and they want to hang out with these characters afterwards and but I think if you take that attitude, it, it, it compromises you, even not a subconscious level when you're, when you're filming. Um, ah, I mean, I because to... you meant to have some sort of distance between you and the character, yeah. you mean? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. I'm, and I think, you know, I think they probably respect you more for it, that you're not, you know, you're making a film about them, that's all. That is all. You have to build I know a relationship. They, I, with them. I, know, I do know for a fact some of them keep emailing you, like before they die or something on the db cooper characters? i mean yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, but that's a sort of but that's partly a duty of care more than a friendship thing it's not like i'm suddenly oh shit i need to i need to give bernie a call because i'm missing him it's just you know it's keeping in touch <laughs> and saying how you're doing because mm -hmm. they haven't seen the film yet so i think you still have a duty of care to them until they've seen the film and then you know hate you or <laughs> something i want to ask as well john if you still have time to chat a little bit longer yeah, a little bit longer yeah. uh so talking about characters you filmed for example for db cooper and then characters you cut out of that film yeah when i found out that some of them you know you spend time it might be even a special trip just to film them and their story and then it's just on an editing floor on a cutting floor do you by now you just easily do it or is no it still i hate that it nagging? i hate it i hate it i hate doing it because you know even though you don't become their friend you have to build a relationship with that person and you know i w i always want to honor somebody's story when they're in one of my films i want to know that i've 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 caught their story properly or at least tried to and if you get you know it's a big deal it's a really you shouldn't forget as a documentary filmmaker it's a big deal for someone to sit down in front of a camera and unburden elements of themselves. And I think you have to respect that process. And I don't think it, I'm going to say this one more time about Tiger King. It's the final time I did enjoy it. It's very successful, but I just feel at times they don't respect the characters enough in that, in that, in that series. And I think that's sad. Um, and you have to, so if you film with someone and they give you a piece, they're not just giving you a piece of their time, they're giving you a piece of themselves. And it, to then do that and then take them out of the film is, it is hard. And I do have sleepless nights about it and I have regrets about doing it. And I don't enjoy the moment where I have to tell them. Do you ever, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you ever sort of email them or call them and explain this would happen? Well, that's why you're not in the film? Yeah, I think you have to because they've given, they've given you the, their time to you. So you have to, you know, you have to give at least, at the very least, that back. You know, some of the early films I made, I unfortunately or fortunately had the camera turned on myself in them and it was one of the most instructive things i learned what it is like having to present some of yourself to camera and i think people forget that because people in documentaries aren't actors i mean some of them try and be and they 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 sort of act out a role of themselves they think will be more interesting but you know you know nine times out of ten people in documentaries are not actors and you have a responsibility to them being on camera and it's a big deal it's a big deal and uh, what's their reaction usually is it sort of disappointment or is it more inquisitiveness why are they not in a film it's usually it, you know thankfully it hasn't happened too much it hasn't happened too much in fact cooper it, you know the problem with that and i i don't have a problem explaining that one to the character who's been put on the cutting room floor is that 
because it took us so fucking long to raise the money for that film two key characters in that story sadly passed away before we could film with them so it just made that story in the film so much harder to tell and it goes back to the one of the very first things i said on this is that it's always like who is telling the story who is telling the story and you know there weren't enough storytellers in that in that story to make it work and we tried to make it work jeez i mean you were there we even went and filmed that very bizarre scene with him and that friend of his in the car in the car park of the library in that town in the rain to try and give it another element which is one of the strangest things i've ever filmed and would somehow have liked to have got into the film but it just it it just didn't work so yeah um and that yeah. was yeah one of the most yeah tricky things to cover as well. I learned a lot on that film, even as a kind of documentary DP to an extent. You know, you learn a lot about coverage. You suddenly realize, okay, that's how editing works. When you were feedbacking, like, where the fuck are the driving shots? Yeah, yeah like, and then you realize, same same as shooting like two or three people. All of a sudden, in I your head, you're just on... editing like as as you shoot. When I pitch on documentary style commercials, I'm in the treatment, I'm always at pains to explain, you know, there is this conception of documentaries where you just turn up and wave the camera around. It's it's mm -hmm. not. You've got to in telling someone's story properly, you, you don't need proper cinematography coverage. You need proper coverage of their story. I don't feel Listen, like I wanted to ask you Say again. All these people that had questions, did any of them have questions? I think they asked a couple. I'm going to look into it. I have one sort of finalish from from me in terms okay. of the budgets and, and where you came from and where you are now. Do you feel that bigger budgets do make a better doc? Does the money matter? Because obviously there's an image of slightly lower budget medium than fiction. I think for feature docs, the money matters for the edit. I think the edit, particularly on feature docs, is is crucial because you do need to get what is, you know, again, rather in a rather cliched manner, referred to as the third act. A lot of documentary subjects don't naturally lend themselves to a third act. You know, a lot of docs are very good as an hour, but once you get over an hour and you need to turn into something else and resolve it... You know they're they're hard, and that they those sort of moments are constructed more in the edit. And I think the edit, mm -hmm. the longer you have in the edit, the more time you have to try material and fail with material and try other things with material. That's I'd always always have more edit time over you know a better camera or even a bigger soundtrack, a bigger composer. The time in the edit is is like gold. Um, Can you talk a little bit through your process of editing? Is it sort of shaping first, or do you delve into certain key scenes? What's just, well, where do you I, start? I first of all like to shoot and edit. That's my ideal. So I like to shoot material, some material, and then start cutting, and then shoot some more. So if I have a series of characters, I'll shoot one or two of them. And I won't shoot all, in an ideal world, I won't shoot all my material with them. I'll maybe come back and do a pickup shoot with them. But I want to edit first because I think there's a danger of you shoot. I always feel that the biggest mistake in documentaries is shooting too much material. And, you know, one of my very basic pieces of advice is always on a first day with a character, you know, it's the same with Bradley. The temptation is always to take the camera out immediately and just start filming, start filming. We've got to get this. We're missing it. We're missing it. I'd rather sit down and chat to Bradley on a first day at his kitchen table for two hours without even taking the camera out of the bag and then maybe take it out for 10, 15 minutes at the end of the day. You'll get more and better material out of him in that 10, 15 minutes than you would have if you had the camera running for the three hours. You may keep thinking, oh, that was great, that was great, I missed that. Well, that's life, you miss a load of shit. But sometimes you store it away and you think, I'm going to get that somewhere else out of him another time. So but I guess it's also being on your toes, right? Because I remember when we were filming a DB 
Cooper Bernie character. It's one of the first days in US in Florida. And they're like, let's roll, because he's there naked on a balcony waving yeah. at you, John, yeah. and you're meeting him first time. So that's yeah, what that's I, a meeting you suddenly you suddenly yeah. just suddenly want. Shit. There. That's yeah, when I, 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 I to come out of his balcony unlike that. But yeah, those sort of characters. Um yeah, but again, as soon as we got that moment, we then stopped filming and then chatted to him for a long while and set up and um yeah, I can't remember what, what was the original question. <laughs> it's fine. We somewhere we're talking somewhere. Let me ask couple from couple from here. So people were asking. Yeah. So Tom is asking. I don't know if you see the question, but I'll read it. How All do right. branded docs play into pitching slash being considered for channel commissioned docs? So I guess the brand money versus the the. That's a good question. The branded doc. I have so far only done one and it was a very strange experience i mean i think um actually the lights just the light the sun's gone down in my window i need to um he's gonna be back he's back the um the they're strange branded docs because a commercial everyone knows okay this is being made with a particular message uh docs we want the story is all and then branded falls into this weird sort of wild west bit in the middle where we want real storytelling but we still we still want <laughs> selling selling yeah we still want so the only one i've ever done was uh i mean the title actually sounds as dull as ditch water and the full title is um amiga every split second counts a history of olympic timekeeping <laughs> now actually um <laughs> we actually got some pretty good characters in that film and it actually stands up but because it's sponsored by amiga um and again i knew that from the beginning you know we had to you know interview the ceo of amiga and it's which is a little weird in a sort of 40 minute 60 minute documentary it suddenly it does jump out so i'm i'm maybe not the best person to ask about brandy because i've only made one and i'm not really sure how you you navigate it i mean there are plenty of films out there in which a brand will just put money into and they just want their name at the end and they just want to hang out at sundance <laughs> thinking that they'll get into sundance that's always the first <laughs> thing well we're making this for sundance oh yeah you just make it for Sundance and it gets into Sundance. That's how it works. Making it, but, yeah, um, making it for can. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah, the branding is a tricky one for me. I find I found it a very difficult... Ex Listen, I still did it, and I took the I took Amiga's money happily, although I fucking... Did you buy a watch? Did you buy I asked a... them many times for a watch in many meetings, and I never got a bloody watch. Um... um so I I find that a difficult one. I I I, I get you know there's a clear cut differentiation between documentary style commercials, documentaries, but the branded bit in the middle is is, is the tricky. money better? Like say d director's payment is it better than 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 non branded? I, yeah, on that job, it didn't work out that much different. I have to say, mm. but the compromises like did you have to make a lot? I mean, I didn't think it was too bad. I mean, we used the guy in the Amiga Museum who actually ended up being actually a really good documentary character in the storytelling. So, I mean, the moment, and I'm sure he won't hold us against me, and I don't particularly care because he never gave me a watch, but the, the Amiga CEO, I think his moment slightly jumps out in the film, but um, it's not there for too long. But I think the branded... But it's difficult because... It's, it has to be another source of revenue, doesn't it? And if, 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 if it enables you to get your film made, then I don't think you should not, not consider it. But the, I, I know there are brands that just do it because they want the, the status of being associated with a, yeah. with a, with a festival, basically. Silas yeah. is asking. Good old Silas. Oh, Brazil. Silas. How are you, Silas? How does a young Lovely filmmaker man. get into commercials? And I think maybe you can talk a little bit about how did you end up in commercials when you were always doing docs? Was it after being signed with Pulse? 
No, 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 no. I was at another commercials company before Pulse called 2AM. I, I'm, again, I'm probably not the best on this subject because I came to commercials about halfway through my documentary career and it was basically because um, I was fortunate enough to have a film at Sundance. So I had a film in Sundance and off the back of that was approached by a, a commercials production company in London. And there was a vogue then, and it became ever more so over the years, to, to get documentary filmmakers in to be part of a commercials roster. You know, but then they, directing like a doco style commercials, that's what was kind of the idea then? Yeah. I, I mean, my mm -hmm. first one was, um, um, in fact, the first one I pitched on, which I didn't get, was for British Airways, which was, and it was um, eventually done by um, a girl called Siri Bunford, who's the great commercials director, um, did a wonderful commercial, uh, an ident for Film 4's Kubrick season, where she mm -hmm. restaged the moment of the kid on the tricycle going around the... Um, the over over overlook hotel in the shining um and that 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 british airways pitch was very much you know going to meet like rodeo characters or you know day of the dead in mexico um so it was pure documentary but the association with the brand is hey we fly to texas or we fly to mexico and then the first one i actually did was with the the actor anthony hopkins talking about his favorite movie moments so it was that sort of doc style interview but do you enjoy doing commercials yeah i really enjoy them um uh they have the downside that it, that docs do it's no different um i think the challenge of making you know going from 90 minutes to 90 seconds or 60 seconds is a really good discipline you get to work with a whole different set of people you get to work with more expensive cameras you get better hotels which is nice now and then <laughs> better get flights better, as we get know better flights you get wine with your meals um that's if they i mean a commercial still going to happen after all this i've no idea <laughs> <laughs> listen i'm gonna ask uh, one last from ksenia how do you yeah. know if the idea for the doc is good well sometimes you don't i mean i think it sometimes I think if you film with someone, again, we talked right at the beginning about filming some material with someone, and if you feel it comes alive or it leads to, it, you know, it's it, it can be as basic as this is an interesting, unusual story, or this is an interesting and unusual take on a story I thought I knew. I think you really just have to go with your gut instinct, and then it does come down to, you know, I keep going on about whether you, who tells the story. Well, it also comes down to, can you tell it? No, John got kicked out again. Give us a sec. I think he'll join. He will um, join us. Here he is. Connecting John now. That's pulsed. That's <laughs> James, <laughs> disconnecting you now. I didn't say anything bad time. about pulse, did I? <laughs> no, I'm joking about the the whining and dining. Um, good. I think that was that was great. Yeah. And Tom, Tom just asked something about kind of a bridge between. Oh, is disconnecting again? Oh, no, oh, live. Do you keep a small crew size when shooting commercials? Tom is asking. Yes, I like to. Often, often the budgets I'm given, Tom, I have to, but um, I like to. Actually, that's a good point because the very the first commercial I ever did um, with Anthony Hopkins, and it it had a big budget, so there was a huge, and it was in the states where they like a big crew in the states. In fact, you have to have a big good crew old in the union, states. yeah. Exactly, and I remember turning up on set, and I'm like, "What the fuck are all these people going to be doing?" Do you know what I mean? <laughs> And I have to say, at the end of the day, I did think, what were a lot of those people actually doing? But, <laughs> you know, I got paid, I got some nice wine, so um, I, 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 I can't complain. A nice hotel. John, thanks so much for this. 
I think it was a good convo and a nice band. I mean, her band. You should have asked. You should have asked more questions. You let me ramble on. I ramble on if I'm let. I like no, it's man. We went through almost all of the questions. Um, I do have one. I do have one more. If you, if you still have five well, minutes. Well, for, for the six people who are out there, I'm willing to stay for one more question. <laughs> um, I was watching your Peabody Award speech yesterday. I found it on YouTube. Jesus, great! You first of all, this shit. Well, <laughs> research. I dig deep. Uh, first of all, there's a great tie you were wearing. And secondly, you mentioned kind of jokingly that, that you are a sore loser in these award kind of situations. And you were Emmy nominated, BAFTA nominated, Sundance Grand Twice nominated. BAFTA nominated. <laughs> <laughs> and then my question really is, is not so much about the awards, because obviously everyone likes a bit of an award and it helps a film, it helps to promote. I guess it eventually might help to win some. But as a, as a documentarian, do you have to lose a lot while making the films? Do you have to sacrifice and compromise throughout? Or is the auteur sort of strong there? No, I think you always have to compromise. I think if you're not compromising, then you're doing something wrong. Um, uh, in terms of losing a war, I mean, I, you know, it's a very awards fixated industry. It is. There's no getting around that. Is it? Because, yeah, I think it is because awards help you. And but then you look at every fucking documentary filmmaker, and it's like award winning documentary filmmaker. I mean, every documentary filmmaker is award winning in some sort of respect. And I actually genuinely don't think I make films that tend to win awards because most of my films are quite daft or quite stupid or quite a bit more of a romp. And they, um, you know, the Scientology film, of which I'm very, very proud of, I think the one award we won was the NME Best Film Award, which is that trophy that's the middle finger. Um, and I think, you know, you know, a lot of films win, a lot of documentary films win because they're almost awarding the people in them. And they go to mm -hmm. films that are very serious and distressing and... Mm -hmm. You know, and often like they're... free solo to an extent, yeah. <laughs> and often they're, they're they're well made, but you can't. I'm just if, if I get to an award ceremony, if you get that far, you might as well fucking win it. If I lose it, I'm not going to pretend. Uh, uh, I'm pissed off. I'm like I fucking wanted to win that, and I didn't. <laughs> but then you know, there's usually you know semi decent wine there, so you can drown your sorrows. But and semi decent yeah, hotel. <laughs> The compromises of a documentary filmmaker are not really that many. It's a privilege to be doing it. It's a lot of fun. You know, you moan about it like you moan about any other job. But I think we're all, you know, genuine. And it's rare for me to be serious. But I think at the moment we are, you know, we're all being quite humbled by people that are working on our behalf in hospitals and supermarkets at the moment. And I'm 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 fortunate enough to be still carrying on with the documentary at the moment, and I still am my miserable self at times with it. And I've found myself several times a day thinking, "Fucking hell, mate, get over yourself." You're making it's great, and I love it when people watch it and they're entertained. But at the end of the day, you are just making glorified wallpaper. You are. And on this note. A talk yeah. about glorified wallpaper. Yeah. Thanks. Stay in. So, stay, so, so, in. So stay, stay in. Stay safe. Save the NHS. <laughs> Love ya. Thank All you, right, Bye. Cheers. Bye.